Warcraft's world is huge. It is, at least, two continents worth of massively multiplayer online role-playing, all divided into distinct zones with their own flora, fauna, politics and problems. The quests have you performing all kinds of tasks, ranging from checking on someone's mother, to uncovering huge conspiracies and slaying dragons. But it doesn't just end there, and in a way, it never ends, because this is a world shared with thousands of other players, who between each other have created and continue to create their own cultures, histories, and stories. And this is great, and it's beautiful, but whilst flying up and down Azeroth, my eyes can't help but be drawn elsewhere, to the places between places, away from playable and non-playable characters, but not from character. This video is a tour of some of Azeroth's unfortunately, but understandably, overlooked back alleys, back rooms and blind spots. Enjoy. Deadwind Pass is passed through to get from Duskwood to the Swamp of Sorrows, and that is its only purpose. It's a grey husk of a zone, full of long dead trees and huge craggy rocks, and should you travel through it, only its blistering wind will keep you company. Once players have crossed into the swamp and found a flight point on the eastern side, there is no incentive for them to ever return. There are no quests, interesting mobs, no vendors, nothing. But if you were, despite of all of this, to return to the pass and venture deeper in, you'd be in for quite a surprise. Down at the bottom of the Deadwind Ravine is Karazhan, the magic tower of the last guardian of Tirisfall. Years ago, after its previous owner was defeated, the place was sealed, and has since become forgotten. This place is wholly unlike any other part of Azeroth. It's a huge structure that reaches well up into the sky, but today we're not going up, but down, to the crypts beneath. Very little is known about the crypts, and funnily enough, that's what makes the place quite well known in the game's community. And if you're on any other version of the game than the first, access inside is quite securely blocked though there are cheeky methods of getting through. Though we're sheltered from the wind of the pass above, instead what we hear is replaced with the clinks of faraway chains and an ever-present heartbeat. In the first room is the Well of the Forgotten. I wouldn't get too close. After the first room, we're taken further down into the earth through the Pauper's Walk. The walk splits apart and winds around and around and all the while down, over the bones of skeletons of all misshapes and sizes until it reaches two different rooms. The first is a huge chamber with an uneven, bone-ridden dirt floor and two rows of three individual tombs. Each tomb has its own large iron gate or door that sounds terrifying when opened. The second, even further underground, is another large chamber with large mounds of dirt to either side of a long trench. It's as if the place has been plundered of either its treasure or its bodies. From here, you can go either left or right. On the left are two sets of portcullises leading to a small room and three big holes. The first and last holes are deadly drops, but the central one is safer and the extra platform that breaks the fall leads further down to the large and open Tomb of the Repentant, a long and empty area save for its shallow rectangular pool. There's also this doorway off to the side, and it goes into the pit of criminals, a second pooled room with a colossal pile of bones dropped down from the top of the Well of the Forgotten. Across from both of the pool rooms is yet another pool, but this one is far deeper. Swimming down inside and then up into the next chamber reveals something incredibly morbid, the upside down sinners. Huge hooks hang from the walls and ceiling from long, thick chains, and along these chains are bloated human corpses. Some hang from their wrists, others from their necks. Some hang downwards, while, curiously, some of them hang upwards. To this day, there is no clue as to their identity, nor any explanation of their fate. They've just been here, alone, for years, hanging out. This place is a really creepy corner of the world, isn't it? and the fact that its story was never told makes the crypt even more cryptic, though we've recently entered a new season of Discovery, in which perhaps this place will finally get its time to shine. Far, 
far away from anything even slightly notable is Newman's Landing. I don't remember what I was doing when I first came across this place, but I do know that I must have been very bored. The landing is nothing but a single house and it's landing. The house is deserted, occupied only by some skeletons, and before the Wrath of the Lich King expansion, that was it. The place was completely empty, but in Wrath, High Admiral Shelley Jorick was added, alongside two bodyguards. He belongs to the Booty Bay faction, and is actually a vendor who, for some reason, sells blacksmithing supplies. He also sells the plan to make the solid iron mall. It's useless. <laughs> A couple of other facts about this goblin is that he plays gnome voice lines, which is amusing. What did you? And that killing him rewards five reputation with the Bloodsail Buccaneers faction. There was a time when killing him on his days long respawn timer was actually a viable strategy to increasing that faction's reputation to Exalted. The thought of someone actually attempting that makes me shudder. It's a very, very small location, but I think that maybe it's the most remote in the game. In Wrath, Stormwind Harbour was added, and it's not too bad of a swim from there, but before that you'd have had to hook the coast all the way from either Menethil or Westfall. The Warcraft wiki mentions a theory that the landing is a place where newly made characters are born, before very quickly afterwards being teleported to their proper starting zones, but I couldn't find any sources for that and I'm going to assume it's not true. A truly useless place, but also truly interesting. Tenaris is a remote zone, right in the southeastern corner of Kalimdor. It's a desert, both literally and figuratively. There's the odd skeleton or ruin, but most of it are just sandy dunes of nothingness. But around the edges are some interesting places, especially around the coast. According to the map, well past the mountains is a triangular patch of land poking down to the south. There's no proper route down there, but should they go exploring, a patient swimmer would find themselves at the Land's End beach. The place is full of turtles and not much else, but a look out to the seas reveals that we're not quite at the end of land. Far away are the silhouettes of two islands, well off the map. Those who try to swim over will run up against fatigue and won't be able to get too far, but with the right amount of preparation, you can just about make it to the closer island. Despite how remote they are, the islands are actually quite populated. There are some South Sea pirates, some goblin and gnomish buildings, and even an empty oil rig between the islands. The place seems quite normal and unassuming, honestly, aside from the mound of freshly dug dirt in the southern island. During the scepter of the Shifting Sands questline, you're sent here to retrieve a book that was buried for safekeeping. What you dig out of the ground isn't quite what was expected, but that's another story for another day, because if I went on a tangent about the set through the shifting sands, we'd be here for hours. Flying over to Moonglade, many have noticed a special bit of scenery on the ground below. A village of dancing trolls isolated in the mountains. Of those many, some have probably wondered if it's possible to get there. And of those some, a handful tried. And of those handful, someone, at some point years ago, finally found a way in. In the western reaches of Winterspring, just above the entrance to Timbermore Hold, is a hidden mountain trail. It is clear that no one is supposed to be here. Balanced between Winterspring, Fellwood, Darkshore and Moonglade, this route is very dangerous. Not because of any enemies, but because one false step could see you stuck, very stuck. <laughs> From here, the only way forward is down. And if you were to use a way to break your fall, you would land down next to the Shatterspear Trolls unscathed. There are a few buildings, a cool bridge, a cave with some stone tablets, and of course, lots of dancing trolls who are happy to let both Horde and Alliance join in. Where was I again? Ashara. Though now it's a remote and relatively empty place, it used to be a huge elven city, and the incredible amount of millennia old ruins attest to that. 
These ruins, the monsters inside them, and the very temperamental elevation make this part of Kalimdor's coast especially hard to navigate through. But should you not accidentally fall off any cliffs, you're treated to one of the most interesting and beautiful places on Azeroth. There are a load of unique hideaways in Ajara, but I want to showcase a place I've never seen until recently, something especially special. On the far side of the Forlorn Ridge, an empty mound that blocks the view to the coast, and past Lake Menar, a tiny pond that was likely once much larger, is open countryside. A place free of the heavy infrastructure of the rest of the zone. After a stroll away from the old city, eventually two tall pillars come into view. After that are a set of bridges with incredibly steep and unforgiving drops below them. If you fall down here, you'll have to swim all the way around. Over the bridges, the pillars are revealed to be legs. This is called the Ravencrest Monument, and judging just by the legs and head at their base, the scale of this statue is incredible, and it would have been a wonder of the world back in its day. What is now Ashara was once the capital of the Night Elf Empire, and what's left of this statue, more than anything else I've seen, paints a picture of what the world looked like prior to the Great Sundering, and just how much of it has been completely lost to history. During their time in the Hillsbrad foothills, all both Alliance and Horde players must have at one point wondered what this seashell-shaped island off the coast was about on their maps. But as there was no incentive to swim over, few players would have taken the dive. The island is Purgation Isle, and it's not a seashell, but instead a stack high above the waves with a steep path spiralling up to a ruined tower at its peak. The place seems to have once been some kind of religious sanctuary or chapter house. It is still quite populated, though not by the living. The ghosts of many paladins, clerics and other classes are still walking around, completely hostile to any visitors. Most of them are level 58 elites too, so any levelling adventurers from South Shore would be punished for their curiosity should they try to approach. The story of this place is revealed very unexpectedly, in Blackrock Mountain. Whilst halfway through the long and arduous quest chain to upgrade parts of each class's dungeon set, players have to talk to the ghost of a gnome called Bodley. One of the tasks you perform for him is to gather components, and this quest can take you to one of four places. Frostwhisper Gorge in Winterspring, Hive Regal in Silithus, Tears Hand in the Eastern Plaguelands, or Purgation Isle in the Hillsbrad Foothills. Should you get the last variant of this quest, you're tasked to defeat these ghosts until one of them drops a unique item, the Soul Ashes of the Banished. And the description reads, These ashen remains of an exiled soul pulse faintly with the echo of a once promising life. So from this we can gather that the island was once a place of exile from the church, where paladins, priests and other clergymen were sentenced for their heinous crimes. The next quest in this chain also has four variants to kill four different bosses, and to accompany this hunt you're given a book with more information on the possible targets. Under the section about a two-headed ogre necromancer called Cormac, it explains that one of his heads was good, whilst the other was quite evil. The influence of the evil head led Cormac to dabble in necromancy, and one of his first necromantic acts was to summon the spirits of Purgation Isle and torment them. Cormac would later find himself in Scholomance, but of course, that's a story for another day. Oh, and one last thing, I really like the statue down by the landing. The wine glass could perhaps reference some kind of suicide ritual in which the condemned of the island are purged, but I'm probably reading into this a little too much, aren't I? At the top of Dunmoreau is Ironforge Mountain, and just by its side is Ironforge's airfield. Alliance players are likely accustomed to passing over it on flights north to Menethil Harbour, and that's as close as you're supposed to get to it, but over the years people have devised cheeky ways to break in, and when they do, they're greeted by some lovely scenery. The most notable part of the airfield is of course the airstrip itself, and its long line of gnomish flying machines off to the side. You'll see one here or there, but never this many in the same place. Also, it's not exclusive to the airfield, but I love these turreted structures that the dwarfs build out of the side of all of their mountains. It really adds to the scale of the city in the mountain. It looks really nice outside of Grimbatol too, if, if you cared. Down from the airfield, the skirmish that you'd usually see happening on the frozen lake from up high is actually joinable. 
Ironforge fends off against Frostmain trolls on a constant loop, and of course, they win every time. Around from this skirmish is a way even further up, right to the peak of Ironforge Mountain. It takes quite a while to navigate yourself up, but thankfully some explorers are camping halfway up and you can rest at their fire. Interestingly enough, these explorers belong to the Stormpike Guard faction. Just a tidbit. We definitely weren't the first up here though, there's a firmly planted dwarven banner from before, next to the exposed remains of an unfortunate explorer who didn't survive the trip. So it seems the view really was to die for. In Ironforge's throne room is a big sealed door. Most closed doors in this game don't lead anywhere, they're just scenery, and this one is too. But at some point in the development of the game, other plans were made. On the other side is Old Ironforge, the deepest and most ancient part of the Dwarven Metropolis. The tunnel down is as long as the chamber at the bottom is big. It's a huge open cavern, dominated by colossal purple crystals, a kind I don't think you can find anywhere else. A regally carpeted stairwell leads up to a central upper platform, with nothing on it. Was this once maybe a throne room, or some kind of ceremonial site? Later versions of the game did answer this question, but as for this place's original intent, who knows. Old Ironforge's darker, more Moria-esque architecture is a favourite for the part of the player base that delights in going to places they're not supposed to be in. As Blizzard blocks ways in, we simply find another. A long swim from the coast of Dustwallow Marsh is Alcaz Island. It features a prominent lighthouse, a huge landing, watchtowers and ruined buildings. From these features, and similarity of its name to a certain island in our own world, it seems to be a prison. The incredible amount of protection is also a giveaway. On the ground, a group of Naga called the Strashaz litter the place. They're all elites and some of them are over level 60. And in the skies are lots of patrolling fire main drakes at the same levels, making this place perhaps the most secured area in the entire game. Tucked in bed upstairs in the large building at the centre of Alcaz Island is Dr. Weevil, an evil gnome scientist who somehow lives here with his minions. His minions are inside this building and outside next to his parked flying machine. They are, or maybe were, dwarves with scary looking goggles and bright blue skin. Defeating Weevil is a tiny, tiny part of the huge scepter of the Shifting Sands quest chain. As stated before, not going to go there, but he does have 326,000 health, so don't wake him up. Trailing off of this central area is a path upwards to an abandoned old watchtower with some kind of magical runic circle at its base. And I've not found any information about that. What I have found information on is regarding the island's underbelly. Throughout the island are these barred up holes, the kind I don't think you can find anywhere else. The way down there is just next to Weevil's flying machine, and heading below reveals a secret underground prison complex. The place is partially flooded, and it seems like a lot of it has been caved in, leaving just a single empty cell. At first glance, but the keen-eyed will notice that this part of the flooding is far deeper than the rest. Underneath is a swim to a secret section of the prison, containing Tide Lord Rurgaz, a generic enemy. <laughs> this is a bit of a letdown, but there is a very interesting reason why. The Tide Lord is a mere replacement for who stood here in the earliest patches of the game, King Varian Rin. Originally, the Long Defias quest chain would have led us down to this room. We'd have likely fought our way down here, rescued the king and saved all of Stormwind. Plans seem to have changed though, as at about the same time the gates of Ankaraj opened, Varian was gone, and Dr. Weevil made his bed on the island instead. But without our help, the king would eventually find his own way back home anyway, so it's okay. Jumping west from the Thandol span and then swimming north will take you to Faldir's Cove, a small quest hub in the Arathi Highland zone that a lot of people missed out on, before quest teeth that is. Jumping east and swimming north however, will take you somewhere questy never would. The swim is a very long one, but at the end of it is a small patch of land much closer to sea level than the rest of the highlands. This place has no name, no quests, no chests, no enemies, nothing like that. It's just a dwarf husband and wife. 
living at their farm, taking life one day at a time. There are two patches of crops growing, some kind of cereal, a big landing area, some nice dwarven architecture, a load of rats, most of them are white for some reason, a couple of rams in the stables, an outhouse, and a farmhouse with a greatly detailed interior. And that's it. It is Sanctuary Manifest. Thanks for watching. Please like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you like me, and leave a comment if you have something to say. Channel members I'm Mellus, Morian, Silux, Nightseeker, Jonathan Bankson, Riley, Cornpops871, Schoon, Patrick Manhora, and Dark Lord Grimace all got access to this video 100 hours before you did. Check out the join button below to learn more. Take care.